All right, fiscal policy. It's not as long. There are a couple of videos embedded inside which are interesting. Construction projects by the government help create jobs. So what is your opinion? What are the incentives, the sacrifices, and the alternatives involved? Write at least two items for each of the three questions and start by recording this slide number. Fiscal policy is the use of government spending or taxes to influence the economy. Notice that we have two important tools here. And the, the objective is to get back to stability. So either to get rid of unemployment or inflation. Those are the two evils in macroeconomics. So in the case of unemployment, the policy is either to increase G if the government spends more money, right? Or to reduce taxes. Okay, so that would be the way to stimulate the economy. Now, if you remember, we had something called disposable income, right? Income after taxes. So if the taxes are lower, what happens to the people's disposable income? If they're paying less income, they have more disposable income, so spending is going to increase, right? So you have to write your aggregate ex expenditure formula in this case because we're dealing with that side of the economy. Fiscal policy is always on the spending side. So what you get is if G goes up, well, that's a direct influence on aggregate expenditure. If taxes go down, then you get more spending by households and firms. So the CNI would go up. Either way, aggregate expenditure goes up, aggregate demand goes up, it shifts to the right. And if you do the graph, you can easily see that the equilibrium will have a higher price and higher GDP. And more GDP means more demand for workers. So there, is be, there will be more jobs. On the other hand, the solution to uh, inflation is exactly the opposite, either spend less or tax more. So if you tax more, the disposable income is going to decrease, so the consumption and investment would go down. And if G goes down, again, you get direct influence on aggregate expenditure. Either way, less spending, less demand, and the new equilibrium is going to have a lower price and lower GDP. Lower price means lower inflation. So this is really the, the gist of what fiscal policy is all about. And, and the, the logic is what you've seen before. The logic is actually quite clear how it works. Uh, now we're going to see that in reality, it doesn't really work this way. And we're going to see why. But there are two names here. The first type of policy is called expansionary fiscal policy. And the second one is contractionary. Notice that it's called expansionary because GDP goes up. It's an expansion of GDP. Okay. And the other one is called contractionary because GDP goes down. All right, so that's how you can tell. Um, what I would emphasize here are, is the idea of having government spending and taxes. So pause here, um, write down uh, the slide number and one sentence summary for yourself and some good notes on this slide. Let's do some practice. You should be able to show graphically how each of these events would influence the economy. So in the first case, we have government spending lowered. And in the second case, we have taxes lowered. OK, so first of all, start by the policy name. So which type is it? Is it expansionary or contractionary and the effect of it? So for the effect, you have to start by writing your aggregate expenditure formula and then determining which part is increased or decreased and what happens to it. Your tip is that fiscal policy always shifts the aggregate demand curve. Okay, it's a demand side policy. And then you would shift your curve, do the labeling proper, properly, see what it, where is the new equilibrium, what happens to the um, to the equilibrium price and equilibrium GDP. Okay, so pause here, take a few minutes, uh, write the slide number, do two graphs, do a neat job with a ruler and draw it with your own hands. If the treasury were to fill old bottles with banknotes, bury them at suitable depth in disused coal mines, which are then filled up to the surface with town rubbish and leave it to the private enterprise on well tried principles of the CFL. To dig the notes up again, there need be no more unemployment. That's what Keynes said. Can you imagine? Now, to give him credit, he said that at a, uh, with respect to the futile gold mining going on in the 30s, in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, but still, there are major problems with fiscal policy, as we're going to see. Now, you might be like, hang on. Nobody does this. Like, I mean, obviously what he meant was that the government should spend money on the economy to create jobs. And that is what he meant. And we're going to see. Um, but the idea is that actually people do this. Um, and, and a good example of that is the army. Right. So let me show you some nice video. This is in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, this is the largest aircraft boneyard. So these are all old um, 
military airplanes which are no longer of any use because there is new technology and they they basically just dismantle them or just destroy them um, the problem with that is that military spending is self uh, self-fulfilling so you spend more money uh, you build up your military the other parties also the other countries do that and then you have to do it so it becomes a vicious circle uh, and then at some point they actually end up uh, destroying these things so what happens is that you get something like this this is really what Keynes said um, just building rubbish and spending money and then destroying um, and it's huge like 12% of the US GDP is being 12% uh, of the taxes in the US is, is going into the army in Canada is 8% which is still a lot 21 billion dollars per year going into defense and, and we are a fairly peaceful country all of that is the taxpayers money without any accountability something that's also interesting is that Germany and Japan after the Second World War they were very limited in terms of their uh, army and that turned out to be a blessing for them because they, they don't have that kind of waste going in their in their economy right so you always have to ask about where is this money coming from and what were the other alternatives right so this is known as uh, Keynesian uh, military Keynesianism okay so what I would say here you don't need to write down the codes just pause and write a one sentence uh, summary of your thoughts about uh, what you just saw and if you need watch it again the argument of fiscal policy is that the government projects would inject money in the economy and that would create jobs that's the idea of Keynesian economics the problem with that is at what expense Okay, what is being sacrificed? Do you think that's a free lunch? The idea is that there is, you can't be so smart. It's just like finding a magical shortcut to, to create jobs. It's not as easy as that, right? So how much to pay the contractors? No way to know the real cost. How would, you, how would the government know what is the value of each, pro, of each project? Okay, but the result of that is only incentive for corporations to overstate their costs to get more funding. Because there's no way for the government to, to know the real cost okay the real cost can only be known through the market and then they use the extra funds to sponsor the politicians okay so this is why it happens right so you get a vicious circle where the where there's this process of lobbying and subsidies between the government and the companies and you can see why it keeps going because the those companies keep sponsoring the politicians in the elections okay so the real value is known to the unknown to the government we saw that before the, the prices, the, the willingness to pay, and the cost, those are dispersed. Those are diffused information across the society. This is where you get rent seeking, which is instead of, instead of becoming more productive and more efficient, the companies spend their resources to gain, to gain the government, uh, the government favored position. All right. And that would be destructive competition and distorted incentives, right? So you are, you're directing the incentives of the companies in the wrong direction through fiscal policy. In short, fiscal policy really leads to corruption. That, that, that's really the, the essence of it, okay? Um, so it does, it's true that it does create jobs, but only in certain industries at the expense of others and at the expense of all the taxpayers, right? So you have to be very careful about that. So pause here, write a one sentence summary and some notes. Another problem with fiscal policy is that it has never worked. All right, so I'm gonna give you two good examples for it. The famous thing is the New Deal by President Roosevelt during the Great Depression. So he injected a lot of money by projects. A very famous one is the Hoover Dam on Colorado River. Another example is the Marshall Plan after the Second World War in, in Europe. None of those actually created jobs. Um, the way the way we got out, out of the great depression was through the second world war and even at the beginning well when people are conscripted into the army the, the labor force shrinks so, so the unemployment rate goes down but that's not important the idea is that when the when the tide turned then that creates a lot of hope so that creates more spending and more uh, investment by the firms so really it really comes down to the idea of confidence and future expectations of the people so the war inspired new hope and inspired new life into the economy but it's not what the government does another example is the recovery act uh, of barack obama after the financial crisis of 2008 so what you see here is the solana station in arizona which cost uh, two billion dollars but again that didn't work now what's something ironic is that whenever the government project doesn't work their excuse is really interesting their excuse is only if we had more funding so it's like they, they spend all this money and they ask for more, right? That, that's all they say. 
So anyway, pause here, uh, record this slide number and just the one sentence that you learned from this slide. So again, the Keynesian thesis is that the government spends more money and that stimulates the economy. What you have to ask is how does the government pay for its higher spending? And there are two possible solutions for that. One of them is through taxes. Well, the government would tax people and then spend that money. But notice what happens. If, if they were to tax people, what's going to happen to the households and the firms? Are they going to have more money or less money? They're going to have less money. So consumption by households and investment by firms would go down, which means GDP would go down and that's going to offset the greater government spending. Okay, so you, the, the three dots is something that you should be able to fill yourself. So you have to write your AE formula and show which, which side is going down and which curve is going to shift. So you've already done that. So that, that doesn't work. So that's a disaster. Another option is borrowing. Okay, so the government says, hey, I'm not going to tax you. I'm just going to borrow. Okay, that's also possible. But the thing is, if the government starts borrowing, there's going to be less loans available to households and firms. So there are also a limited amount of loans in the economy. If the government takes it up, there's going to be less loans available to households and firms. So again, consumption and investment would go down and you offset the result. Okay. So again, you should be able to write down the, the, the process, but it's just going to be the same procedure. Okay. So none of that would work. This is called the crowding out effect, okay, which is a really special term. And that's when the government policy is offset because of its effect on the private sector. Okay. So the gist of it is that more government spending results in less private sector spending. Um, so when you raise the, the government spending to stimulate the economy, it's going to result in less CNI and there is an opportunity cost between them. Okay. So that's going to defeat its purpose. The greater the role of the government in the economy, the more things we let the government do. What it was, what's going to be the result of that? These are some important observations. First of all, we're going to have less liberty and less choice for the people because the government is making the choices. Another thing is that there is less incentive to innovate because the government doesn't have any competitors. Okay. When you have private firms, they have a lot of incentive to innovate and be more efficient. All right. And the incentive for lobbying will go up because everybody would like to have a piece of the government's power and that creates even more inequality. And overall, the efficiency goes down. Okay, so I really like this cartoon because it shows the, the difference between the, the mentality and the incentives involved between the private sector and the government. All right, so pause here, write a one sentence summary, and take some notes. So, where does the government money come from? We already talked about that it's either taxing or borrowing. Okay, now if they borrow, that's actually not really different from taxing because if they borrow, they will still have to pay it back later with interest. So later, what do they have to do? Or later, they would have to tax in order to get the funds to pay back, right? So you get back to the initial point. So really, the only source of government revenue is taxation. So that's super important. Now, you might be like, hang on, how about printing money? Well, printing money is called monetary policy. That's a different thing, and it has its own problems. But the gist of it is this. There are no shortcuts. There are no magical ways out. OK, so any government spending equals an increase in taxes, either today or tomorrow. This was a great discovery of David Ricardo, and that's called the Ricardian equivalence. This is why the, great, the policies in Great Depression and Great Recession didn't work. This is why fiscal policy never works. It's because of the Ricardian equivalence. All right. You could also say this. The fiscal stimulus doesn't stimulate more spending because people's permanent income isn't affected. OK, so today you might get more money, but you know that you're going to be taxed more later. So you take that into account. People care about these things. Financial markets react to these anticipations of future. OK, now I want to I want you guys to really know how to analyze these things and, ha and how higher taxes affect the economy. So I'm going to give you a full breakdown of it, even though you should be able to do it by now. So if the government taxes households, they're going to have less money to spend. The disposable income goes down. So consumption goes down. That's how you would analyze the effect of taxing on households. How about on firms? Well, again, the same thing. The firms are going to have less money to invest. So the investment for, by firms goes down. Either way, you will have to deal with your aggregate expenditure formula. So you would have to write that down when you take your notes. And you're going to see that the CNI go down. So the aggregate expenditure goes down. Less spending means less demand. And your demand would shift to the left. You should be able to do the graph and you're going to find a new equilibrium. And the result of that is going to be more unemployment. 
okay so lower demand for workers so that's going to defeat its purpose all right just to show you the graph quickly because i really want you to to have this you start with your regular gdp market that's your initial point more taxes will result in a leftward shift of the ad so you would shift your ad to the left and what you get is a new ad with a new equilibrium and you compare your p1 and uh, with p2 and y1 with y2 and you get the result okay so pause here and record the slide number uh, make sure you write down the record recording equivalence and permanent income some some notes on that and use your own words another super major problem with fiscal policy is this idea of lags so even if the government has the perfect solution and if it were to be effective still it doesn't work because of these lags so first of all, it takes time before realizing that there is a problem. Uh, and a recession is, is half a year of dropping the GDP, so they have to wait half a year to see the GDP going down. Second, there's all the legislative mess that's going on, right? It's haggling over, you know, who should do what, this is right, this is wrong, you know, between the different parties in the, in the Congress or the Parliament. And the, the execution of that also takes time, right? There are actually more lags than this, or you can you can think of at least five different lags, but I think this should be a good point of reference uh, to see that it takes a long time for the policy to kick in and have its results, right? And by that time, it will, it'll, it's going to just make things worse. It's kind of like giving a medicine to someone who has already recovered. Now, the economy doesn't die, but it recovers on its own, right? So you give, the, you give medicine to someone who is healthy, it's just going to make things worse, right? So that just creates inefficiency. And you might be like, hang on, why does it happen? And we talked about why it happens. It's because of all the lobbying and rent seeking, right? So fiscal policy becomes a means for those who have influence to extend their influence. Is there an alternative? Yes, there is. The alternative is hands off. If the government isn't so big, there wouldn't be all that incentive for people, for those corporations with huge influence to extend their influence, right? So not to favor a certain industry over others, not to distort market incentives, just to maintain security, just to be consistent and just maintain the security in terms of having a police system and a judicial system. That's pretty, that, that's a good role by, for the government and just being transparent with that, right? So all of that would create confidence. So if you remember, the driving force of the business cycle is speculation or confidence or future expectations. As long as people feel confident, that's the best thing you can do. Uh, with, with the government policy. There's no need for taxing too much or spending things on, on projects. The market does a pretty good job of that. So pause here, record the slide number, one sentence summary, and some notes. Wow, that was cool. All right, protectionism is when the government limits free trade in order to protect our own firms and workers. And there are a few forms of it. So one of them is a tariff, which is an import tax. It's a tax on anything which is imported from other countries. Another one is an import quota, which is when they limit the quantity. There is only so much that the country can import from other countries. Both of them actually work in the same way, and these are called trade barriers. All right. So and you can think of other things too. All the paperwork, all of the custom procedures that are involved, all the hassle of going through these uh, regulations, all of that would limit imports. Another idea is this idea of infant industry. The idea that if we have small, you know, initial stage companies, we have to protect them from, other, from foreign competition. So we're going to limit imports so that our own industries can grow. And finally, there's this idea of outsourcing. So limiting outsourcing. So that is when the, when the, when the Canadian companies would relocate to other countries or hire foreign workers. Okay. So because that would reduce our own jobs. Right. So these are four arguments for protectionism. We're going to see that all of them are wrong and none of them work. But before going on, I want to recommend to you a very interesting novel. It's called The Choice and it's a very short, so just about 100 pages and by Russell Roberts. And you can see that Milton Friedman also commented on it. So that, that's an amazing uh, book to read maybe for your holiday. Pause here, record the slide number, one sentence summary, and I would say write these uh, four, four items in your own words. So what are the results of protectionism? The first thing you have to ask is at what expense are we doing it? What is being sacrificed? Well, if you limit our imports, there's going to be a shortage of imports. Now, what does a shortage do? What happens when there is not enough of something? Its price goes up 
right? And that means more co more costly living for Canadians, right? So that that's the loss of well-being for all citizens in Canada because they have to pay more for everything. Also, it creates incentive for lobbying by domestic industries for exemption and preferential treatment. So if you have a policy of protectionism, every company would like to qualify for that for that so that they have less competition from, from foreign countries, right? Again, you, you see that the resources are being directed in the wrong way. And that's called rent seeking. By the way, these, these terms that keep showing up, you might wanna write them down and know their meaning. I'll just keep giving you different, uh, different versions of them. It makes us less competitive and less productive. So if there is no competition, well, we're not going to be innovative. We are not going to increase our quality. And some infants never go, grow up. If the companies are used to receiving all these subsidies and this preferential treatment by the government, why would they have any incentive to grow up to become more competitive? So the key to efficiency is competition, not protection. Right. So foreign competition is actually good. It makes us it, make, it makes us excel. It makes us, you know, push ourselves to our best. OK, so basically this is an amazing picture because it shows that protectionism is shooting one's, oneself in the foot. This is really true. And I want to emphasize it. And so make sure you write this down that even if the other country treats us with protectionism, even if the other country limits our exports, still it's in our own best advantage to not limit their imports, right? So the idea is that even if they restrict our imports, it's better for us not to engage in protectionism. So it doesn't matter what the other side does for us, it's better not to get into protectionism. This is super important because of these results that, that protectionism always has. So it's always better to remain open to international trade. So uh, record this slide number and write a sentence summary and notes. Now you might be like, hang on, what's the opposite of protectionism? Well, it is free trade. And what happens when there's free trade? So free trade means there are no barriers to imports or exports. Everything is available. So the government doesn't impose anything. So first of all, there's going to be specialization. Each country focuses on its forte and then they exchange. And this way they can jointly benefit each other and minimize their costs. So that's a win-win situation. All right. Not to mention, by the way, that free trade itself, one of the main benefits of free trade is just freedom. The, the people, the individuals in the society have more freedom. That itself is a great gain. The negative is that there's going to be temporary loss of jobs in some industries. That's true. Right. So, for instance, when companies move from here to other countries, some of our jobs are lost. But that's only temporary first. And it's only in some industries. There's going to be permanent gains in other industries due to specialization. So there, we had textile industry in, in Canada, especially in Quebec. All of that was lost, but we got more specialized in, in more technical uh, industries. So that's actually a benefit because we become, we become more skilled. So the idea of foreign competition is also interesting. Foreign competition isn't something bad. You shouldn't be upset about it. This is an advantage. It's an, it's an advantage to be more efficient, to be more innovative. So that's going to result in technological advancement and the living cost for consumers would go down. Because if you are importing things at a cheaper price, then everybody in the society is going to be better off. For the producers also, the firms have lower costs. Overall, the standard of living, the GDP per capita would increase, which means more efficiency. All right. So it's going to have a higher growth of GDP. So pause here, record the slide number and take your notes in your own words. Wow, that was nice. All right, this is a very common misconception among a lot of people, including students. So mercantilism isn't something just in the 18th century, it still exists, the thought of it is. So here are a few statements to think about. Exports are good, imports are bad. Exports stimulate the economy and create jobs while imports depress the economy. It's better to keep the money at home and protect the domestic jobs, right? This is a huge fallacy, right? As I said, it's very common. You guys probably, some of you have this, this idea, but we're going to see why it's wrong, right? So the gist of it is that exports and imports are interrelated and interdependent because of foreign exchange. So let me give you an example. Let's say we start importing a lot, right? So we, we start importing a lot from China. Okay, now the mercantile and protectionist guys would be like, what have you done? This is not good. 
But let's see what happens. If you're importing a lot from China, it means we're buying a lot of Chinese goods. Yeah. So how do we, how do we buy that? How do we pay for it? We would need to have Chinese currency, but we don't have Ch Chinese currency to buy it. So if you want to buy Chinese uh, Chinese goods, we need to give them Canadian dollars, right? So we are paying them a lot of Canadian dollars to import from them. So think of China. China is receiving a lot of Canadian dollars. But what can China do with Canadian dollars, really? Like, what, what is the good of Canadian dollars? The only use of Canadian dollars is to buy Canadian goods. That's, that's, that's the use of it. So what happens is that in the long run, what happens is that the money comes back to Canada because the only thing they can do is to buy our goods and services or to invest it in our country. So, we, the, so what happens is that we get cheap imports, we get cheap goods and services, and the money comes back. That's why it's a win-win situation. That's why it's, it's a smart thing to do. So what I want to emphasize is that imports are not bad. Imports are smart. And exports and imports go hand in hand. They always move together. It's impossible to have a lot of exports with low imports and vice versa. So pause here. And we're going to see more of this. I'm going to explain it to you further. But, but pause here. Write a one sentence summary. And, and then we move on. So here's why mercantilism is a myth. Let's say we export a lot as these mercantilist people like it. If we export a lot, we'll have a lot of foreign currency because we are selling to them and they are buying from us. So they are giving us their currency. But what would you do with it? What would you do with foreign currency? The only thing that we can do with foreign currency is buy foreign goods, which means imports, right? So when we import by the same token, it enables our trading partner to purchase from us. We give them our currency and the only thing they can do is to buy back from us. So in the long run, imports are paid for by exports. So there's this mutual relationship between the two. Okay. Restriction on imports like tariffs, for instance, will only reduce our ability to export because they go hand in hand. Right. And that, we, that would mean less jobs in the export sector. So again, you can see this idea of favoritism. You are just favoring one sector over others. This is exactly what happens when there is government regulation and intervention. So we have this politician uh, shooting a lot of tariffs at other countries by having all these barriers. But what happens is that these arrows will just come back at them, right? They're just shooting themselves in the foot. Trade is beneficial not because of exports, but because of the specialization and getting things cheaper. All right. Buying local, that's also a myth. Buying local is not actually a smart idea because that means you're impeding Canada's growth. So why, why is that? So let me give you an example. When we talk about trade, it doesn't, there's no difference in principle between trade between countries or trade between cities or trade between households. So, so think of your own household. If you were to produce everything at home, right, for yourself, then you're going to have a lot more jobs at home. You're going to have a lot of work to do at home, but that has an opportunity cost, right? So the opportunity cost is that you cannot do other things. You cannot specialize. So that's the idea here. So being self-sufficient is really the same as being inefficient, right? Because you are not able to focus on what is your forte and you're just trying to do everything uh, by, by yourself where you are not really that effective. Okay, so pause here, uh, write this slide number, uh, take, take some notes. And what I would emphasize here is, is this idea that in the long run, imports are paid for by exports. Today, we talked about two major policies. Fiscal policy is based on Keynesian economics, which has two tools. Protectionism is based on trade barriers, which has two main types. Both of them will result in inefficiency, and we talked about four major types of inefficiency. All right, taxes are offset because of the Ricardian equivalence, and that is because of the permanent income hypothesis. The opposite of trade barriers is free trade, which says no to import quotas and tariffs, and that is based on specialization, which is ignored in mercantilism. All right. The concepts I would emphasize here are taxes and government spending. That's really the definition of fiscal policy. So you need to know what is fiscal policy all about. It's all about taxes and government spending. Ricardian equivalence and impermanent income are somewhat advanced, but I really want you to know what fiscal policy is, is all about. It's, it's often taken for granted that it works, but it doesn't. So I really want you to know what is its pitfall and why it's ultimately ineffective. Now, I didn't have, I know it's kind of messy, I had to cram everything in here. So when you take notes, do a better job. 
And what I would say here is this, add at least three concepts that are not covered in this, uh, in this uh, concept map from today's lesson. So you have to go back to your notes and find three concepts that are not here and add it to where you think they would belong the most. All right, so pause here and do a nice job with your own concept map. That was long, but also a very important lesson. So let's pause and go back to our initial question. So re-answer the three questions that you see. Um, it should show some deepening on, of understanding. And then I will give you some sample answer. So with respect to the incentives, you could say it could be getting out of a bust or a recession and popularity for elections. What is sacrificed is investment by firms as the crowding out effect and jobs for, for those whose voice cannot be heard. So that has to do with lobbying. What are some alternatives while well, reducing taxes that could create jobs? Or let the market decide which project would need to be done and by who. All right, have a wonderful day.